questions and you want answers. Welcome to the Q&A show. It seems like a very long time since uh, we were live on air and I uh, just want to welcome you to another live show as far as it is concerned on the Q&A show that is. And Dr Grady is with us uh, for this week so please get all your questions, biblical questions, uh, to the ready. Live at revelationtv.com uh, is the telephone number on the screen which is uh, SMS's and send your text there. Uh, please uh, welcome Dr Grady. Ha ha ra! <laughs> 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 I think we're on some, some sort of theatrical show. Section. Yeah. <laughs> now it's nice to have you back, sir, and see you back at home, which is good. Yes. Well, don't get here very often, as you know. But uh, oh, and don't forget your science questions as well as the biblical ones. That's right. Uh, so have them all ready. The only ones that uh, Dr. Grady doesn't go near are the eschatological ones, which is all about end times and the prophecies, particularly concerning end times. But prophecies on, in general, the, they add a lot of weight to the Bible's credence, do they not? Well, yes, and of course there are many fulfilled prophecies which we can talk about. You know, the historically fulfilled prophecies are, are tremendous, especially, say, Daniel's prophecies, Isaiah's, and so forth. The, all the prophets are important. But some of the prophecies are phenomenally accurate. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, uh, it's, there are different ways for uh, various people to interpret them. And yet the, it says in Scripture that it's the Holy Spirit that is really the one to interpret Scripture. But uh, we do help Him rather a lot, don't we? Well, indeed. Uh, we have to look back with a historic perspective and take a look at, a, no, you know, no prophet is a true prophet unless all the prophecies are true. And of course that's one of the things that we can look at the Bible with its integrity is that all the biblical prophecies that have been given and fulfilled in the past have been dead on. And we have therefore every reason to believe that those prophecies which are yet to be fulfilled will also be fulfilled exactly in the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we'll get into that a little bit later as well. But uh, text and emails are already coming in. There's one from Dave here. It says, good evening gentlemen. Please can Dr. Grady explain if and how uh, polonium halos can disprove the Big Bang Theory. Uh, and that's from Dave, as I say. Uh, I would not relate the polonium halos to the Big Bang personally. Uh, first of all, uh, there's much new research on polonium halos which you may not be aware of, which indicates that uh, they may not be as useful as we once thought in terms of a young Earth. Um, they're interesting, certainly, as an artifact. Uh, but modern research has put them into somewhat of a speculative nature where we have so many other scientific arguments for young Earth, young universe, we don't really need them anyway. Um, but in terms of the direct relationship, the only thing was that we used to use them as one evidence for young Earth. Frankly, most Christian scientists don't bring them up anymore, uh, simply because new research has, in fact, indicated they may not be that useful. Mm. Okay. Uh Dave, I hope that helps a little bit. If you want to add more to that, do write in again. Uh, Peter Robinson writes in. Uh, oh, that's to Tim. That's the, for the Bible study that's just uh, finished before us. Okay, so no doubt uh, you want to pick up on those by uh, and adding those to your next uh, Bible study uh, questions. Creationworldview.org is where Dr. Grady's uh, website is, and so if there's any other further uh, inquiries you want to make, please do look at that, it'll come up on your screen. Dr. Grady McMurtry, creationworldview.org. Now, there's a few things happening in the world today which should be of concern to us all. And one is the, uh, what looks like a possible uh, coming plagues. Now, I don't want to get into the, the book of Revelation for you because that's obviously, you know, different ways of interpreting that, and especially when it talks about the chronological timing of those such events, we know their future. But did I see something uh, on the news flash today? I just walked in the room and had to walk out quickly, that there is an, a, an epidemic which they're worried about uh, that's somewhere in the uh, Asia group uh, that's uh, possibly going to spread quite quickly and it could be quite contagious. Well, there's a new uh, bird flu variant that is quite a bit of concern. Uh, people are dying from it, and at the moment we have no effective means to counteract it. Um, that is starting in China and the Southeast Asia area, as it usually does, because of their very high population densities. Um, and that is becoming problematic. So, for instance, our Center for Disease Control, CDC in Atlanta, uh, is looking at this, trying to determine whether we can come up with, in fact, a vaccine for it, and so on. 
but it is very problematic. I would point out, uh, without being alarmist at all, I hope, please don't take me the wrong way, uh, I don't want to get into plagues, but I would point out that such things as this virus mutating are simply a part of the continuing decay of the system because of human sin 6,000 years ago, and that we certainly will see more and more of this in the future. Mm. It's ironic because last night, my wife and I, now Leslie hardly, she just doesn't watch television, okay, but when she was doing her emails at the same time I had this film on, and it was all about um, what happens in the future in, with regard to a, a, a very contagious plague that uh, becomes pandemic. Is that the right word? Yes. Okay. And of course, as I te tell you and have said many times before, do not get your education from Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. But, but it's interesting that they use these for scripts and they're looking at what uh, the, the Bible is saying because they use a lot of the terminology that's biblical. Um, so, you know, like Armageddon, for example, yes. a film by, with Bruce Willis in it and, and others uh, uh, like right. that. But, you know, the, the, when we look at the scriptures and you mentioned uh, the prophecy being that's already had fulfillment, it's, it's easy to look back on and see that in place. Now, but when we look... Uh, at what Jesus said, <laughs> this is a topic that I shouldn't really talk to you about, but I find it fascinating that, but as we see things are starting to collapse, even within uh, the monetary system, for example, we saw what happened in Cyprus a, a few weeks ago. Um, yeah. Spain is doing something extremely interesting uh, or worrying, or it, it has a good aspect to it. Um, let me ex try and explain it to you. It's where the Spanish authorities are asking all uh, foreigners uh, that who reside here to um, f fill in particular form, I think it's called a 720, uh, whereby you have to uh, give uh, details of all that you own uh, in any other part of the world outside of Spain, all your bank accounts, every single detail, how much you had in there at three di different given dates in the past, obviously, um, and uh, just so much more detail than I've even our own governments have ever asked of us. Now, what, is, what does this say to, to you? Um, and I know that your wife works in uh, the, the finance world. Uh, is this something that each uh, government across the world could actually follow so they could um, uh, exchange information uh, on any given individual or corporation? Well, of course, I think it's an increase in the Big Brother syndrome, George Orwell all over again. Exactly. Uh, this is a, an attempt to get away from uh, an underground economy. Uh, this is which an is a good thing. Control. Which is a good thing. Well, in some ways it is, uh, but in other ways, uh, we have to take a look at the, the symptoms, and not merely the disease. Um, when you have an underground economy, it is a symptom of the fact that the government is too involved in the economy. You see, if the way? government were not as involved in the economy, you wouldn't have so much black market, gray market, uh, barter, yes. and so forth. So to me, um, one of the sheer uh, symptoms of the decay of any society, any country, is when the country passes more and more laws, regardless of what they are. Uh, because when Christians are supposed to have internal Christian self-government, but people have lost this through their secularism, they're, they're going back to an evolutionary worldview, uh, they, they lose all sense of morality, uh, right and wrong, etc., then the government has to tell them externally what's right and what's wrong, and, and this is just an indication of the decay of the whole system. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's right to pay unto Caesar what is Caesar's in, in, in tax yeah, terms. Ta that's, taxes, that's... taxes, per se, I don't have a problem with as long as they were used rightly. Unfortunately, as you and I both know, tax money is being absolutely wasted in every country in the world on all kinds of things. Uh, the greed, the corruption, uh, bad programs, uh, worthless Cronism. programs, etc. Mm -hmm. But there are certainly, there is absolutely a biblical basis for government. There's absolutely a biblical basis for taxation to support the reasonable government. But it's to do things such as our American Constitution originally invent, envisioned, which was, you know, protect the borders, build the roads, have a military. Uh, it was never intended to be a welfare state, etc. Ironically, I mean, only in the newspapers of uh, recent days have uh, so many Spanish uh, figures uh, that work within local government, uh, especially around here, uh, were in, uh, are facing trial because of them 
taking money out of the tax system for themselves and uh, laundering mm -hmm. it. So, I mean, it, it, it's a shame on, in one sense that you, you, we do pay much higher taxes here than we do in the UK. Uh, and, uh, but it, for it to be siphoned off in this way, it's, it's uh, really tragic. But it's the one good thing about it, it will actually uh, sort out those who are into money laundering, who are into crime, particularly like mafia crime, which is quite big business. Um, so therefore, the sort of the underground uh, monetary system, the black market as it's called, isn't it, uh, would actually hopefully disappear. So you can see there's, there are good sides to that, but it affects a lot of people with regards to uh, their being fearful that are they going to do something that Cyprus did recently and just come, thank you very much, we'll have that. Well, that's the problem, which is, yes, if it stops money laundering, I'm all in favor. As you know, my wife is involved internationally with this sort of thing in her work. Um, but if it's being used, and, and ultimately, of course, the downside of that is to, in fact, take money out of private accounts, um, simply say that whatever you've got is, belongs to the government, then that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. um, okay. The, the, so do you think this will lead to a cashless society, perhaps, as well? That, that's another choice that uh, the governments, if they get together about, would actually benefit by having a cashless society, because they could uh, stop a lot of the you know, the, the, un, the, the sort of black market. Mm. Well, again, in theory, you know, it's one of those things about it looks good on paper, but it doesn't necessarily work well in practice. And so, uh, again, there are many good and bad aspects to these kinds of systems. Uh, I was in Estonia two years ago. It, it was interesting to me that they have eliminated checks in Estonia, you either do cash or you use, uh, in effect, a debit credit card system. But there are no more checks. Mm. That's right, isn't it? You know, so we're, we're heading in that in that way, aren't we? Really, you know, so that all everything's so much easier to do uh, through just money transfers, etc. But the well, and it, be, it it becomes you know all electronic. Yeah. yeah. Of course, the, there are downsides to this, such as what happens when the electricity fails. Good point. We, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so cashless has its downsides too. Right. Let me read this. It's a little smaller writing. What do you think uh, of the work of Bart Ethram, Ethman, uh, who is considered one of the world's leading Bible scholars, but fortunately, through though he started off as a Christian, he's now highly critical of the Bible, especially the New Testament. Yeah. Uh, personally, I'm not familiar with the name, so you might have a comment out I don't. Yeah. I, well, let's just take it from a different angle. Uh, we've heard uh, quite the opposite happening as well, where some people who've been extremely anti uh, the Bible and Christianity or faith at all and come from an agnostic or atheistic background uh, and uh, just uh, read the Bible and became convinced that it was the Word of God. Uh, Hal Lindsey was an interview that I did many years ago and he said one of the greatest legal minds that America had uh, looked at the Bible to see if there's real evidence of, for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he said there was far more and better evidence for, for that than there was that Julius Caesar ever existed. And, and to an extent that's true, although I would not have picked Julius Caesar. Uh, but nonetheless, <laughs> uh, there is ample evidence that the resurrection is true. Mm. Uh, in my own life, my own conversion to Christ, uh, one of the things that, uh, and I would say the, the last straw that broke the camel's back for me personally was that indeed 500 people were willing to die without recanting that they had seen him after the cross. And therefore, uh, to me, that was what sealed it. No one will knowingly, voluntarily die to support a lie. Mm. Very good. Very good point. Uh, Alex, um, if you wanted to put a bit more meat on the bones as to why this man changed his mind uh, about uh, the Bible and Christianity, uh, that might help us to understand uh, how he arrived at um, really falling out of faith, as it were. Uh, let's have a look at what Peter is saying. Could you ask Dr. Grady if he believes Luke, the writer of the third gospel, was a Jew or a Gentile? Well, first of all, Luke came from uh, Egypt as a Jew. Um, this is one we know this for a variety of things, but as a, a Jew who came from Egypt, 
um, and came to Israel. He had grown up with Septuagint. And so he was a Greek-speaking Jew from Egypt. Rather than a, a Gentile? Uh, not, a, not a Gentile. Right, okay, that's interesting. Because a lot of people think he, he, he was a Gentile, uh, but, and just a believer, but interesting. So he was part of the, um, the Egyptian as it were. Yeah, part uh, of the Egyptian Jews. Jewish community which mm -hmm. used the Septuagint because in Egypt uh, Greek was the language that they were using. Mm -hmm. um, is that and that's why they, they translated the Hebrew text into Greek. Does it go back to Alexandria? It goes back to Alexander, it goes uh, back to the Ptolemies and so forth, yes. Yeah. Uh, when Alexander died, uh, his empire was of course split up amongst his generals, one of them being Ptolemy. named Ptolemy. Yeah. That's it. Um, took Egypt and um, became a, a actually a pharaoh, and uh, the most famous of which probably to anybody is Cleopatra, who was the last of the Ptolemies. Uh -huh. God, you get, don't get all your history from the History Channel, get it right here on Revelation TV <laughs> <laughs> from Dr. Grady. Uh, why did Jesus say only the Father knows when it the end is, why not the Holy Spirit too, uh, as he is part of the Trinity? Well, first of all, Jesus, uh, when he speaks, uh, he is the theanthropos. He is the one who is 100% God, theos, God, and 100% man, anthropos. So he's the theanthropos. Mm -hmm. And because he is God, he is perfectly able to speak solely out of his humanity in certain instances and solely out of his godship in others. And when he said only the Father knows, there's two things that you need to remember. First of all, this is the statement made by the bridegroom uh, concerning the, the wedding ceremony. And remember that uh, as Mary and Joseph were betrothed, they were considered married, but the marriage ceremony had not actually taken place. And the young man had to go home, build the chadar, uh, and build the house and so forth for them. And only when the father said that the house was perfect and complete and ready for the bride would there there be the ceremony. Well, that was, so people would ask the bridegroom, well, when is the wedding? And he would say, only the father knows. Mm -hmm. And this so Jesus was using that wedding terminology of the bridegroom, as he is the bridegroom and we're the bride. But he was using that in his humanity uh, because as God, he certainly knew, but he was able to separate this from his humanity. Mm. And so he said, only the Father knows. It was that, that wedding expression. And secondly, he was speaking out of his humanity, pointing out that, that he was separating himself from his Godhood at that point, and saying, only the Father knows. Well, yes, the Holy Spirit is God as well. And they are, they are the three in one, the triune God. But Jesus was speaking in his humanity at that particular point. Mm. This is, a lot of people struggle with this, don't they? Because they hear several uh, statements from uh, Jesus when he was on the earth uh, by saying things like, the Father is greater than I am, um, and only the Father knows, as you were saying here, the day, the hour, nobody yes. knows, but only the Father. Uh, and, and expressions like that, do you make you think they're, they're separate? And this is what they forget, is what you've explained, is that this is, he he'd al almost humbled himself I think the scriptures that do say that, that the, he's humbled himself to become this uh, l a lower level, even than the angels, yes. um, to be man at this time. He, he, he voluntarily took the role of the incarnate Christ, lowering himself. And indeed, the angels amazed that, that he would do this. Uh, but it was a voluntary thing. And yet he also said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father, for we are one. Mm. So, you know, there are times when he's speaking out of his godhood, and there are times he's speaking out of his humanity. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, Martin writes in, he says, is the incidence of global earthquake and flood on the increase, or with the advent of global communications alerting us all the more generally and drawing from a wider plane? Good question. A actually, it's a great observation. It's not so much a question because the fact of the matter is, and, and this is, you know, go back to prophecy for just a second. The prophecies are that there will be greater and greater uh, calamity in the end times. And this is to be expected because what we're seeing is the aging of the system. 
as I have pointed out before, as the earth, as the universe get older, they're becoming more and more corrupted, more and more decayed because of the second law of thermodynamics specifically. But the earth in particular, uh, earthquakes, cracks in the earth, which can lead to volcanoes, um, we are, will see more and more of them because it is a natural consequence of the age of the system. That as the earth gets more cracked up, it will continue to get more and more cracked up. Same thing with people. I'm sure, Howard, you would agree, the older we get, the more cracked up we are. No, really? <laughs> I only looked in the mirror just before I came on, and I just went like this with my eyelid, and it just went about three inches to the left uh, voluntarily. <laughs> just so much elasticity in my, in my face these days. Anyway, um, we do the best we can. No Botox, no Botox. But Absolutely what you see is what you get. That's, that's it's me too. It's all jowls and... <laughs> what's this, the turkey neck? <laughs> Anyway, saving it for Christmas. Uh, do you know, I've got to say, there are now so many emails and texts. Thank God you're going to be on for the rest of the week. Whoa, whoa, yes. whoa, whoa, whoa. So well, but, let me get on to the next but one. My point, my point was, yes, there's better communication. Yes, you know about things yeah. happening that might not have been reported previously, but there's also an increase in them, too. And yeah, so, that so good. An exponential increase, I've, yes, I've been told by experts. Um, yep. Right, we would like to know if... Uh, if before the flood uh, there were, anim were animals vegetarians, uh, we read that after the flood God gave permission for humans to eat meat, Genesis 9, uh, 1 to 3. Did this also apply to the animals? Asked Madeline and Colin. Well, yeah, it, certainly, because if you'll take a look at Genesis chapter 1, verses 29 and 30, all the land animals, such as cats and dogs, lions, dinosaurs, people in, as well, were vegetarians. But uh, what happens after human sin and the whole system becomes corrupted and starts into a process of decay? Well, later on, T-Rexes, for instance, would go from being totally vegetarian to also being carrion eaters. The same thing is true of other creatures. Uh, but after the flood, uh, we're told specifically in the Bible, God put the instinctive fear of man in the wild animals uh, so that we would not cause their immediate extinction and uh, he did not do this to the domestic animals. Mm -hmm. Indeed, he gave us three pairs of the clean animals so that the domestic animals would have a high population level because they didn't fear man, and that the wild animals only had one pair of the unclean animals on the ark because they are unclean, and God puts the instinctive fear of man in them to protect them from us because we would be eating meat. By the same token, because of the decay of the system, they themselves would also become meat eaters as well. Have there not been uh, sort of frozen in time, as it were, uh, animals uh, that have been found and thawed out that they've uh, had uh, like vegetarian type uh, food in their mouths or stomach? Oh, absolutely. And for instance, uh, we found a fossil T-Rex stomach with fossil grass inside, pointing out that they're vegetarian. By the same token, we found a different T-Rex where in the stomach there were very small dinosaur bones crunched up. But the T-Rex could not possibly have captured these. They're much too slow to have caught fast, rapid, small ones. What it means is they were eating them like carrion. And even evolutionists for the last 10 years have agreed basically on that point. Uh, and sharp claws and sharp teeth do not. A creature, you know, make a meat eater. Um, panda bears are vegetarians, koala bears are vegetarians, fruit bats are vegetarians. Thank they have you. very sharp claws, very sharp teeth. By the same token, there are other creatures which did turn to eating meat predominantly, but as I've mentioned in one of my presentations on Revelation, uh, where I showed two different lions that were raised as vegetarians and did quite well. Probably did better, actually. Uh, if the water was 10,000 feet uh, deep during the flood, uh, there wouldn't be any oxygen from the trees. So how did Noah breathe? And he'd be freezing. Okay, first of all, I've never said that there was 10,000 feet of water on the earth. If you took a look at my presentation entitled, The Water's Cleaved, we're only talking about a mile of water, or half that amount. Secondly, you have to remember that more oxygen is made by single-celled plants in the ocean than by all the trees and grass on the earth. And third, it's only a year, therefore it's not a big deal. There's plenty of oxygen in the atmosphere for them. They didn't need trees during that one-year period. There's a lot of facets to your question that simply show an ignorance to what really happened. Oh, that's there you have it. 
Um, hi, uh, why did Jesus say, sell your shoes and buy a sword? Asked Rob. Uh, in, in reference, though, to what? Exactly. I don't know. I don't know which... Uh, where, where, what verse are we talking about there? Um, uh, sandals. I think yeah, it's... Yeah, I understand that, yeah. but... First of all, what verse is he specifically yeah. talking about? No, I don't know. That's You'll the have question. To, you need to bring a verse with it. Yeah, you have to, because I, I don't recall that at all. But never mind. It's to go sell all you have and give to the poor. Uh, uh, right back in with that verse, and let's take a look at it together. Yep. Reading, is the Black Sea actually black? If so, why? Says Les Wolf. <laughs> well, the water is dark. <laughs> I would say that. Uh, but the Black Sea is a, an interesting sea. As you know, it's connected to the Mediterranean through the, the uh, Dardanelles area. Uh, however, there's a very stagnant part of the Dead Sea in the middle um, with, so to speak, a, a relatively living section on the top half. I mean, you, you really have to take a look at the whole uh, cross-section of the Dead Sea. Uh, I'm sorry, the Black Sea. Uh, but the water's flowing into it. Uh, don't cause it to be black. It's just dark. Mm. Uh, dark blue water, you know. Uh, if God knows the future and hell is eternal, then hell must have been part of his original plan. So do you really believe he planned a place of eternal regret and torment? Asked Mike. Well, again, yeah, God created the angels. They're created beings, and he created hell, which is a location. Where it is, don't ask. I don't know. Uh, however, it's a created place, created at the same time as the angels, I would suggest. Um, and, and so it is a place that in eternity will be a place of eternal regret. And I think that's a very good way of putting it. You know, people tend to think of it as a place of uh, eternal punishment or, or eternal pain or something like that. But the pain is self-inflicted. It's the regret of not having made the decision the gnashing to of become teeth. a Christian in your lifetime. Hmm. And it's a ter you could say it's a place of eternal remorse. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we have with heaven and hell, regardless of where they're located, regardless of anything else about them, we would say this. Heaven is the location where you will have the eternal union with the only and infinite source of love in the universe, and hell would be the eternal separation from the only and infinite source of love in the universe. I'd like to think that. If gravity was stronger or weaker, would we exist? Now, you, you know, you've got a very good way of explaining this and how it's uh, dropping off. Well, the answer, no, no, no. Gravity isn't dropping off. Magnetic field is That's diminished. it, that's it, yeah. Do, do not confuse the two forces here. Right. Uh, as far as gravity, the answer is no, we wouldn't exist. Uh, and, and in fact, when we take a look at certain specific constants in nature and science, such as G, gravity, or alpha, for instance, that's another one. Uh, we we see that unless they were perfectly where they are, then in fact we couldn't exist. You know, for instance, think about just the size of the Earth itself. If we were 10% larger, we'd be nailed to the floor. If we were 10% less, we'd float away. I mean, you know, it, things like that. How do we know uh, that our atmosphere wouldn't be here, and so on? How do we know that? Because I was just looking at the ocean uh, yesterday. Simple it, calculation. Yeah. But just give us an, to the layman here, well, why 10% more? Well, the, 10 the, the, earth, the earth is basically, you know, an average of 3,900, say, 60 miles to the center, or roughly 4,000 miles, not quite, but close. And that gives the earth a certain mass. That mass it has to be at a certain point, or life on earth would be impossible. Again, if you, you take a look at the size of the earth and increase it to where it was simply 10% more, so instead of being 3,960, or let's call it 4,000, let's say it was 44, well, that has a tremendous difference in the mass of the Earth, and therefore the attraction of things to the Earth. So we'd be simply bound to the Earth. By the same token, if you shrink it by 10%, and say go to 3,600 instead of roughly 4,000, then you have the problem that you have with, say, a planet like uh, Mars, where basically the atmosphere is almost non-existent. Uh, because the gravity is so low. Um, and so life as we know it on Earth simply could not exist. And so the constant of gravity is very important uh, to life on Earth, as well as the other specific constants that we have. And I mentioned a couple of others, but it's a very interesting study. I do talk about that a little bit on one of the articles on my website. Very good. Uh, thank you, John, for the question. Oops. <laughs> just lost all my emails. Well, I didn't lose them. They're just all shot off because more came in. Hang in a sec.
going on to uh, why did God take six days to make the world when he could have done it in a second uh, is there a reason absolutely there's a reason as uh, spoken of not only in Genesis but also in Exodus chapter 20 verses 8 through 11 God could have done everything in one second all of it I firmly believe that you know people say I d cannot believe he did it in only six days and my question after studying this for now almost 40 years is why do he take so long but the correct answer is in the Bible, which is that he gives us a pattern for which we are to work. Six days of work in the natural, one day to work in the supernatural. Um, great show, as always. Could you please ask Dr. Grady's opinion of the controversial Westboro Baptist Church and the way they interpret God's Word, says Will. I, I couldn't make a comment on it. Yeah, sorry. And, uh, if, it's ab if it's aberrant and it's obvious to you, then it's aberrant. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, why is running water so good at cleansing, asks Mark. Well, let's just simply say, first of all, running water per se is not necessarily, but running water is required, for instance, of the Jewish mikvah. And the reason for that is simply that you have bazillions of bacteria on your skin as well as the dirt that's attached to your skin and your clothing and so forth. And so when you take a, a mikvah, it required that you must have running water because what it's doing is it's flushing those things away so that it will not contaminate the next person who comes in. Stagnant water obviously becomes a liability from a health situation. So the running water was simply to carry away those things which were detrimental and therefore not contaminate the next person who came into the bath. Mm -hmm. And it's oxygenating, isn't it? Well, typically, you know, typically the, the faster water is running, typically the more oxygenated it is. Not a given, but it's typical. Mm -hmm. And of course, we could get into things like, why did God make the moon? Well, it's to stir the oceans, otherwise they wouldn't have the oxygen. And, you know, it, there's a lot of things in that. Um, we've dealt with this so many times. Um, so uh, We'll move on from that. It's uh, about the unforgivable sin. Have a look at, uh, oh. look it up. It's, it's there. Uh, it just takes too long. We've got too well, many. Well, there's emails. only one unforgivable sin. That's not accepting salvation. The gift. Uh, why do, you, do the Jews call themselves Israel when the name was inherited by Joseph's son Manasseh and Ephraim, directly from the uh, dying Israel Jacob himself, Genesis 48, 16, not the Jews of Judah, asks Joe. Sorry, well, John. Well, first of all, you have to remember that these words became generic. And so Israel was associated with the ten northern tribes as a generality. Uh, the word Ephraim also in this context. But Judah uh, was actually Benjamin and Judah. But Benjamin was such a small tribe, which is the tribe that basically we have Bethlehem, um, that while it was the smallest tribe in, in, next to Judah, everybody just called it Judah, but they also met Benjamin as well, that was the southern portion that was not carried away into Assyrian captivity. That's the portion that was captured by Nebuchadnezzar. But these words, Ephraim, Israel, Judah, became generic terms, not specific ones, over a period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, this is from Terry. I have pre-read it. I think it is okay to read uh, out. It isn't necessarily eschatological. Um, the Bible uh, through Paul tells us that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord and Jesus told the thief on the cross that uh, he would be with him in paradise that very day. How does this fit in with the judgment uh, that we all have to go through? Well, first of all, think about the chronology of what you just said. Today, after the resurrection, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. However, when Jesus was speaking to the thieves on the cross, the resurrection had not yet occurred, and the thief would be with Jesus in paradise for two and a half days. And then at the time of the resurrection, the thief went to heaven at that point, just as all the other Old Testament saints did at the same time. So don't get your chronology backwards here. Now, as far as the judgment is concerned, I'll leave that one alone, and Howard can handle it, but... but <laughs> But think about what you're saying in, in terms of today to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord as a believer because it's after the resurrection, but the thief, when Jesus spoke to him, was prior to the resurrection. Mm. 
Doesn't the Bible say something like, you know, the day uh, when there will come a separating from the sheep from the goats, everyone will stand before the Lord. Uh, in other words, the oh, there'll be a judgment for yeah, sure. Yeah, you know. and that will either come, uh, it'll come post um, Armageddon um, or the Great Tribulation. It may even come at the end uh, or the beginning of the millennium, or even. And there's another one at the end of the millennium, isn't there? But uh, let's, that's what I get from it. But uh, do you know what? I don't get too hung up on these things uh, because. I trust the Lord so much uh, in the, with the other things like prophecy and the fact that he made us and created us in such an awesome way and he's put up with us uh, and he's put up with all the characters that, have, uh, that are in the biblical record, some good, some bad and some ugly, uh, that he, his judgment will be right. He's a righteous God and you can see that from the way he's dealt with uh, uh, situations. And so whether what comes first or whatever, does it really matter? The judgment will come. Uh, we, there is a new heaven and new earth. Uh, those that uh, don't want to comply and they're rebellious, basically, will not inherit that, and the others will. So, you know, it's, it's, that's it again, in simple again, terms. If you, if you have become a believer, everything else is all downhill. <laughs> that, that's it. It is, really. But they choose. They have, it's not like they're not, you know, programs like uh, Revelation TV, that what they put out, they make it very clear. Uh, so the choices are... Do you want to comply with God's uh, laws and principles? Or you don't. And uh, you know what's coming because they watch the TV. That's, that's the, main, the amazing thing. Why they watch us, I don't know. I wouldn't. Anyway, that's another story. Uh, second Son. Uh, this is from uh, Second Son. Okay. Uh, hi, Howard and Grady. Could you shed any light on why the Bible clarifies bats with birds? Asks Joseph. Barak Hashem. Why, why the Bible does? Yeah classify bats with birds. I don't know uh, where it does that well, or what significance you, for, is. First of all, you have to remember God's taxonomic system is different than ours. We have a taxonomy system that was developed by a Christian creation-believing scientist who took a Latinized name, Carolinus Linnaeus, uh, but he was a Swedish scientist and he was a Christian as well as a creation believer. And he believed that the ability to pigeonhole creatures, plants and animals, was a proof of creation. And so he came up with the basic system that we still use today with some, some modification. But, but he didn't base his taxonomy on God's taxonomy. God's taxonomy is amazingly different. I, I find it really an intriguing study. And there are some articles by some creation scientists who have actually delved into it more than I have. But the Bible talks about the bara men, the created kind. And the word in Genesis chapter 1 that is used and typically translated birds does include bats. Both, oh. So we have both the mammals as well as the birds because they are creatures that fly through mammals and birds, animals that fly through the air. And that's I God's see. classification. Okay. So God's taxonomy is different than the way we do it. Now our system seems to be a pretty good one, but it's different than his. That's all there is to it. Okay. Uh, are we not to fear... Uh, Sorry, we are not to fear the Lord Jesus uh, because he will protect his holy ones. None of the plagues of the Egyptians shall touch the elect, uh, says Michael O'Brien. That's a good point. So the, in the coming days when we do f uh, face uh, plagues uh, of quite some magnitude, um, could we look at the account there when the ten plagues uh, that were put upon uh, the Egyptians and some affected at the beginning also the people of Israel or the Israelites uh, but in the end we saw that the Israelites actually were exempt or, or did not suffer at the hands of the plagues so could we claim that there's a possibility that we wouldn't do this in the coming days leading up to Armageddon? I, I would personally not take that approach. The first nine plagues in Egypt were a direct attack by God against specific nine Egyptian gods, which then affected the Egyptian people only. The tenth plague, the Jews themselves participated in it, of course, uh, but it was still an attack against an Egyptian god who was Pharaoh himself. The tenth plague, which was the death of the firstborn male, meaning that if a male opened the womb of any human female or any cow, for instance, um, they would die if they were not covered by the blood. And so uh, it did not affect the Jews because they were covered by the blood the, on the doorposts and the lentil, the threshold. So uh, 
I, I would be very careful because if you think that becoming a Christian is going to prevent you from getting a disease sometime in the future, I think you've got the wrong motivation into wanting to become a Christian. That, that's a bit hard uh, on some people because I, I would think that they don't do it for that reason, but they might no, no, expect I said it. If. Yeah, but they no, might but expect it given the fact that there are some historical uh, accounts of uh, being set aside and not being um, s not suffering the consequences that other groups of people did. Yeah, well, there, there's God's protection, of course. I'm simply pointing out that if you have a plague, you know, even some good people are still going to die in a plague. Yeah, I have to agree that I would be ready. I mean, because I'm I'm not maybe that my faith doesn't <laughs> uh, isn't as good as uh, Michael's. Anyway. Um, Alex got a good question here. If the Earth is 6,000 years old, are all the other planets and stars no older than that? Uh, or in the beginning, God created the heavens and the Earth equals mean other planets or stars could have been created before the Earth. Uh, you could read that scripture that way, couldn't you? That the, the, the no. The, okay, <laughs> I knew you. Okay, tell us why. Uh, well, simply because if you read Genesis chapter 1, it tells us that the sun, the moon, the stars, which would include any planets that God created, were created on day 4. Ah. And so the oh, Earth is three days older than anything else yeah. in the universe. But some would say, well, he couldn't see the sun because... It doesn't the, the, matter. The mist and all everything else. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, a day is not defined by the sun. A day is defined by one rotation of the earth. Now, God the Holy Spirit started the rotation of the earth in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, on day 1. After the earth was rotating in verse 2, then in verse 3, God the Father creates light, which is traveling in one direction because he doesn't need the sun, the moon, the stars to make or reflect light. And a definition of a day is one rotation of the earth. It doesn't matter whether you see the sun or not. If I put you in a coal mine a thousand feet below the surface of the earth, close the door, turn off the light, you're in absolute and utter darkness. If you then experience one rotation of the earth, and when you come back to the same spot in the rotation of the earth, I then open the door, whether you saw the sunlight or not, you have experienced a day. And God says it's one period of darkness, one period of light, one rotation. Right. On day four, God then creates the sun, the moon, the stars. The sun takes over where God had spoken light into existence three days earlier. The sun takes over for that particular purpose. And the earth is then going around the sun because of gravity. Um, but no, uh, the earth is three days older than any other physical object in the universe, period. Now we know today of at least 500 or more planets, or at least implied, uh, when I say no, it's just a general consensus that they're there because of various uh, evidence, though we've never seen them and we've never actually been to them, etc. Uh, I would not refute the scientific evidence that they're there, but they don't support life. You know, God can, de God can decorate the universe any way he chooses to, and therefore he, he has, and we now know, he has put planets around other stars. Mm -hmm. But they can't support life. Not the ones we've found so far, anyway. That's right. I'm glad you qualified that, because I know they're out there searching. Uh, Satinda yes. writes in, in Genesis, it says that Noah was a righteous man. How can this be when you cannot make yourself righteous, and the only way to be righteous is through Christ? Thus, if Noah was around before Christ, how can this be true? I heard Chuck Misler saying that the correct translation was that he was a perfect man. Um, meaning his bloodline was not corrupted by the Nephilims. Uh, could you elaborate on that? I think there's quite a lot mixed up in there. W let's go back to, uh, who was it? Enoch. How did God describe Enoch as well? Because well, he, he, was, he was living with such a close relationship to God that he walked with God and God took him to heaven directly. Now we know that he will die eventually. That's mentioned in the book of Revelation when he will actually come back to the earth and have to experience physical death. Um, but then again, Elijah is also in that category. Uh, I'm thinking in terms of the fact that he was an upright man. Like, who, look at Job. Look, well, how did well, God uh, describe Job to Satan? Do you remember? Well, you see, I was going to mention Job as well, but Noah and Job knew the ordinances, laws, commandments of God. Noah was a prophet, a priest, and a king. Noah offered sacrifices. Uh, specifically, if you look right after the flood, in celebration of God's preserving them in the flood, 
he gives the burnt offering, which is the highest of the five offerings of Leviticus chapters 1 through 7. And it's the one that's closest to God. Mm -hmm. And so Noah was a prophet, a priest, and a king, a uh, king of his family. He was a prophet of God. He was an evangelist. Uh, he preached righteousness for 120 years before the flood. Uh, but he was also a priest giving the burnt offering, for instance. And we know that Noah knew these things because God taught them to Adam. Hmm. Remember that when Adam and Eve sin, they make vegetable clothing, which is inappropriate for sin, but appropriate for praise and worship. God says, wrong offering, let's straighten this out. He slays an animal, makes the animal clothing for them, sheds the blood for their sin, and Adam learns from God how to do this, and so the process of dealing with this is also mentioned with Cain and Abel. Cain brought a vegetable offering, which God says well, it's a fine offering as far as praise and worship, but it's not the right offering for this particular situation, which had to deal with sin. Go get a blood offering. Cain refused, gets mad at God, can't take it out on God, slays Abel. Abel had given the blood offering for his sin. So we, we know that, that the offerings and the purposes of them were known before Noah, Noah himself did them, and he did them both before and after the flood. That's recorded for us in the Bible. Mm. Now, was he righteous? Well, he was righteous in what he knew. He gave the sacrifices correctly uh, for what he knew. Now, he didn't have the Ten Commandments. He didn't have the Mosaic Laws and so forth. But in what God had revealed to him, he was righteous. Mm. Or oh, faithful is another good word for and, it to put and it. I, I, again, with, with Job... You know, some people, the, the translation is he was perfect. Well, no, it means mature. Hmm. In his he own mature, time as well, it, that the scripture goes on to say. So it was like relative, wasn't it? And it well, it, but again, we know from the scriptures in Job that Job knew that there were ordinances, laws, and commandments of God. We don't know which ones he knew because they are not recorded, but we know that he knew them. Hmm. We know that he gave the sacrifices for himself and his children, lest they should not do it correctly for himself. We know at the end of Job, God says, go to my servant Job, he'll make the burnt offering for you. And again, here's the burnt offering, the highest of the offerings. Mm. Um, and again, Job is doing these things because he knew how to do them. And obviously he got that knowledge brought down from Noah and so on. Mm. Um, so while Abraham, it also in the Bible tells us, knew ordinances, laws, and commandments of God, we don't know which ones he knew because they're not recorded for us, but we know he knew them because the Bible tells us this. Mm. I'm actually surprised that uh, it didn't bring up the fact that um, Noah was uh, mis um, deceived into having sexual intercourse with his daughters. Uh, not Noah. Not Noah, was it? Who was it then? Oh, lot. it was Lot. Say, yeah, I beg your pardon. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Got the wrong Lot. <laughs> uh, please, can you tell me why there are no complete fossilized human bodies found? There are fish and animals, etc. Uh, were they buried so deep under the oceans or under the mountains, asked Jane. Well, actually, we have found human remnants, pits and pieces that are pre-flood. The problem is twofold. Uh, we have actually found some relatively complete skeletons, including uh, there are some that were encased in, in limestone, in, found in 1812 down in the Caribbean islands by the British, and stored at the British Museum of Natural History. And it was actually declared to be proof of, of the authenticity of the Bible and the worldwide deluge, the flood of Noah. But as evolutionary people became dominant in science in the UK, uh, these specimens were eventually taken off display and stored away. For all I know, they either are still on storage or they have been destroyed. I don't know which. However, we have found bits and pieces of humans since then. The problem is that evolutionists know that humans didn't exist million, you know, millions of years ago, so anytime they find a human artifact as they see it, they clump it with the Australopithecines or apes or whatever. For instance, recently we found what is absolutely a perfect foot bone from a human being, but found in a layer from which Lucy, or Australopithecus afarensis, came from, and because evolutionists know people didn't live at that time, was simply thrown in as, as a Lucy fossil, when in fact it's absolutely obvious it's human. Mm -hmm. So there's the bias of the people who found these artifacts. 
Secondly, people died on the surface uh, of the flood. What happens when people drown on the surface? Well, their bodies go down, then they bloat, then they come back up. They are disarticulated easily. We are soft tissue body creatures as defined medically. Um, and the bodies would have been also suspect to uh, creatures okay. who were trying to survive, eat them, mm. the decay on the surface and so forth. The disarticulation would make, make finding whole skeletons very difficult uh, at best. And the misidentification and bias of evolutionists when they have found them. But yeah. what we have found that is absolutely unarguable are human artifacts in layers that would predate dinosaurs, according to evolutionary th thinking. And I've showed many of those on Revelation and other programs. Yeah. Now, this is interesting because let's put the boot on the other foot. If it had been um, such an incredible uh, fossil record that proves evolution over a period of time, then you would find even f billions of. Uh, uh, artifacts and, and also human remains, would you not? Well, I, I, again, let's, as, a, as I love the way you express it in the UK, let's do the maths. If, if a human generation were 40 years, and if humans had been recognizable as humans evolving from apes for at least a million years, well, you would have had 25,000 generations. Uh, where are the artifacts? Where are the bones? Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is that the, the fact we don't have them is a great argument for not only a young earth, but the authenticity of the scripture. Yeah. Uh, Salma, this is, uh, it's not necessarily an eschatological question, but uh, you're saying uh, something about uh, when will the, uh, the timing of the uh, resurrection be in the, the millennium? I think that's something. Um, that's an eschatological yeah, question. Yeah, it I is think. really. Let, let bring that back on uh, next week. I think we have, uh, uh, Pastor Derek uh, from Oxford Bible Church. Um, I recently re re received your study guide of the Feast of the Old Testament, which was a great blessing. Uh, Thank you. How, how did the Jewish nation define a day at dusk to the following evening, or is it uh, to do with the moon rise or setting as the month is from new moon to new moon at the time of Jesus? Great blessings okay. to you both. Tim. I, I, I did discuss that in the syllabus that you purchased. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, and I, I believe I autographed it for you. Uh, We've got two remember, minutes. Remember that it's moon rise or when we see three faint stars, but the day does not begin until the sunlight is completely gone. So today it's defined as 90 minutes after sunset. This goes back to Genesis where the day begins in darkness but ends in light. And so it cannot be twilight. It cannot be just even a little bit of the light coming over the horizon. It must be completely dark. And that, that's either moon rise or there are three faint stars that were chosen when it's dark enough to see those, it's the new day. Mm -hmm. uh, how come Adam and Eve and the rest of the patriarchs uh, weren't warned about the eternal punishment of hell and as how Jesus taught about it when he was on the earth? So when was the first mention uh, of hell? You know, I, I don't recall the exact thing about the first mention of hell specifically. Uh, I'd have to kind of look that up. However, I would point out that they did know that there were consequences. You know, do this, do not do that. If you do that, dying thou shalt die. That when you eat from the fruit of that tree, which I told you not to do, there's going to be consequences. And the consequence is you're going to die spiritually immediately, and this will cause your physical death 900 years later. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, somebody else might be able to find that out, but it would... Uh, oh, I could look it up, but just yeah. we don't have the time. It's exactly, because we've got seconds left. A minute. Okay. Um, sorry about that, guys. And also, as I said, we've got Dr. Grady with us uh, tomorrow, which is Tuesday night and also Thursday night. So for all of you... It's been a great week, man. Yeah, I'm looking forward. And we will start with the questions that we couldn't answer tonight. Uh, so tomorrow, uh, it'll be at the same time. Uh, for the question and answer Thursday will be a slightly earlier time and in the 30 seconds I've got left I just want to say to Dr. Grady we really do appreciate you uh, spending your time uh, with us uh, all the way from uh, Florida and uh, thank you so much and God bless you sir. It's always my pleasure you know that brother. Yeah and to you at home uh, sorry again that we didn't get through everything but uh, we're doing our best it is live it's Revelation TV's Q&A show that's it. It's great to be able to host you this program. Thank you so much for being with us and also just get your questions ready for tomorrow night and also Thursday. God bless you. Take care. Read your Bible. Bye.